With the date set for former President Trump's federal trial, his Republican opponents are hoping for some new attention from voters and possibly a post-debate bounce. Here to discuss it all are Tamara Keefe of NPR and Aaron Haynes of the 19th. Amy Walter is away. And great to see you both. So as you well know, the judge rejected Mr. Trump's request to delay the start of that trial until 2026. We now have the trial date set for March 4th of 2024. By that date, a few states will have already held their primaries or caucuses. But take a look at the calendar, because the very next day, if that March 4th date holds, is Super Tuesday. And 15 more states will hold their primaries and caucuses, those uh, shown in yellow right there. So, Tam, when you, you look at that map and you look at what's at stake in this trial, do you see the trial having any impact on that day? Probably not, because Iowa and New Hampshire will have already happened. And the potential exists if former President Trump who has a prohibitive lead in all of the early, all of the primary polls among Republicans. If he wins in Iowa and New Hampshire, Super Tuesday may not be that relevant. And also, it's not entirely clear that the, that the trial date will stick, uh, that that will be the date. And if it is, it's the date that the trial begins. So what changes exactly um, by the time people are voting the very next day? Aaron, what about you? How are you looking at it? Are there any states you would be keeping a particularly close eye on to see if that trial or any news that's come out before it does have any kind of impact? Yeah, Amna. Well, I mean, you know, what I think is that, uh, you know, this, I certainly agreeing with, with, with Tamara's point, but I do think that uh, Super Tuesday could also be uh, an opportunity for both Democratic and Republican voters to send a message uh, coming out of, you know, what we could call Super Monday, if that schedule holds with, with President Trump uh, in a courtroom just the day before uh, this really consequential election. So, I mean, you're looking at states like Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, Virginia, all of whom have significant numbers of, of black voters. Uh, you know, we have to remember that at the center of all of uh, the former president's legal battles is uh, this, this scheme that was an attempt to discredit, to disenfranchise black voters as illegitimate participants in our democracy. And so uh, I think that those dynamics could loom over Super Tuesday. Uh, you have uh, the former president really uh, saying that he is a victim in all of this, really uh, also trying to get his supporters to align themselves with, with his legal woes. And so they could also be looking to send a message of strong support for the former president. He is certainly seeking that at the ballot box with donations, et cetera. So this could galvanize uh, parties, uh, voters in both parties uh, in a number of states that are having primaries that day. Well, much of that Republican race we know and how it develops depends on the rest of the GOP field. We all noted last week's debate was really the first chance for a lot of all the candidates who are not Donald Trump to try and break through, to try and break away from the pack. So we've got some polls now coming out in reaction to that debate when Republican primary voters were asked who they believe won. Here's who they said in a recent Emerson College poll. 27 percent said Vivek Ramaswamy, 21 percent said Ron DeSantis, 12 percent for Mike Pence, 11 percent for Nikki Haley, 22 percent said no one won the debate. Tam, what do these numbers tell you about what Republican primary voters are looking for? Right. So no one performed better than Ron DeSantis and everyone except for, for Vivek Ramaswamy, who did a really good job of drawing attention to himself. Um, it's not clear whether uh, he did a really good job of persuading Republican primary voters that they should pick him over Trump, for instance, um, because that same poll found that 50 percent, I believe, of uh, Republican uh, voters support Trump and, and want Trump to be the nominee. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these candidates were up there fighting for relevance while Trump was stealing stealing the show by getting, uh, you know, a mugshot that uh, his campaign is then selling on shirts, selling with an autograph, um, and and uh, you know to 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 go back uh, to what Aaron was saying, really um, using this as a powerful tool to get uh, his supporters and and Republican voters to rally around him.
Aaron, what about that? Tam raises that crucial point here. Fifty percent of those primary voters still say they plan to back Donald Trump, but that is his lowest number to date, and it is a five percent drop from before the debate. What kind of impact do you think not being on that stage had on him? I think you saw the impact that it had on that stage when the majority of the candidates, when asked if they would support former President Trump, even if he was convicted of a crime, held their hands high and said that they would absolutely do that. Listen, uh, I think that what that poll didn't ask is, is of the uh, of the people who were on stage who won that debate, because the person who won that debate was clearly former President Trump. Uh, you know, he was mentioned by name uh, several times, but not necessarily in a negative way. Uh, people just continuing to show uh, their support for him, their support for certainly policies that are similar to his, even as they tried to maybe distinguish themselves uh, from other people who were on the stage. And, and again, uh, you know, this did not uh, deter any any of his vote, voters uh, in, or, or persuade them in, in the direction of, of any other candidates to any large degree. And his closest contender, uh, you know, Governor DeSantis, really was kind of overshadowed by the likes of Vivek Ramaswamy or even Nikki Haley, who had kind of a breakout night that has given her some momentum coming out of that debate. And so, uh, you know, I would say, uh, you know, former President Trump is, is the one who won that debate and, and, and really kind of uh, proved his argument that he doesn't even need to be on the stage to continue to be impactful and also to continue to hold sway with, with, uh, with, with his, his base and the Republican Party at large right now in a primary. Well, Aaron, you mentioned Ron DeSantis, who remains in most polls second place to Mr. Trump. I just want to ask you about some news over the weekend. He attended a vigil yesterday in Jacksonville, where, as we know, a white gunman had targeted and killed three black people in another racist shooting in America. This is the reaction Ron DeSantis got at that vigil. Take a listen. Aaron, those are clearly boos from that crowd as he walks to the podium. Mm -hmm. He's running for president, but this is the reaction he's getting from fellow Floridians. What does that say to you? You know, I think uh, that it says that uh, this is a crowd, this is a state, uh, especially uh, black Floridians who do, uh, you know, hold Governor DeSantis at least uh, partly responsible for, for what happened in Jacksonville because you had this incident occurring and if a child in Florida were to go to school uh, today, this week, and ask, you know, how, you know, what were the dynamics that contributed uh, to that shooting happening, a teacher might not even really be able to explain uh, to a child based on the policies that, that Governor DeSantis has championed. It might be uh, considered woke to explain to a child what happened uh, over the weekend, uh, maybe uh, discussing the March on Washington, for example, might be okay. But, you know, another anniversary that we're marking today is, is the 68th anniversary of Emmett Till being murdered, uh, which is not uh, something that, that, that uh, school children are supposed to learn about because it makes people uncomfortable. But, but uh, really, uh, you, you saw Governor DeSantis obviously couldn't really talk about a looming hurricane coming to the state without also addressing this horrible tragedy that happened in Jacksonville. But yet at the same time, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, somebody who uh, has been discouraging uh, Floridians uh, and, and, and would like to discourage the rest of the country from really learning about the uglier parts of, of our, our country's racist history, uh, you know, for somebody like that to show up and, and, and try to uh, show their support for the community, uh, you know, I, th I think him being met with with those boos was was uh, not necessarily a surprising reaction for folks who have been following uh, really the, the racial tension around uh, a lot of the rhetoric and policy that, that he's been espousing down there. Tam, just a few seconds. Yeah. What's your take? Sometimes showing up uh, and getting booed is part of being the governor, part of leading a state. And uh, Governor DeSantis is facing this hurricane that is headed towards his state. Uh, this will be another opportunity for him to lead and uh, for him to, uh, as part of his campaign, show that he's, he's governing. Mm -hmm. um, but governing is not always easy. That is that has proven true. Of course, our thoughts are with the families of those affected in Jacksonville and everyone in Florida who is bracing for that storm. Tamara Keith, Aaron Haynes, so good to see you both. Thank you very much. Thank you.